Okay, so first of all, could you tell me more about your initial big expedition where you led the first unsupported women's crossing of the Greenland ice cap? Uh, yeah, it was in uh, 1992, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I started to think, because I got this dream to ski to the South Pole when I was a kid, uh, eight years old or so. And then I realized that being a teacher, high school teacher, I could not afford it. Mm -hmm. And in, in 1988, it was 100 years anniversary since Frit Fritjof Nansen crossed the Greenland ice cap. And it was several expeditions planned only by men and they didn't did not want to have a woman <laughs> on their team so then i realized that i should t start uh, to get um, get a, a, a friend a woman with me and i was skied with uh, julia maske uh, both of i met her on uh, svalbard because we were both um, guides up there mm -hmm. at trekking trips and so we had a great trip we had an attempt with we had two four we were four women the year before, but then we were surprised by um, a Peter Ruck. so mm -hmm. we had to uh, turn and go back. And then uh, I realized that uh, Julia was the, the right person to ski with. So, mm -hmm. so if you hear something, it's my um, it's my dog that wondering who I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> We had um, we got a storm uh, um, on the top of the ice cap. That was the most scary thing with thunder and uh, a lot of snow. Um, so we we had a really good good uh, trip. I think it took us twenty three days or so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could I ask what sort of attraction the that the open ice has for you? Because all of your expeditions have been in very very cold countries. I think it has something with my uh, you know, upbringing in Norway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, had, I loved skiing since I got my first skis when I was three years old. My parents remember that. And, uh, and it, you know, just out in the outskirts of Oslo where I live, it's so many, it's beautiful uh, ski, ski routes and treks. And uh, my parents um, uh, went uh, on our winter holidays and Easter holidays uh, uh, up to a mountain farm. Mm -hmm. And that was not, there was no trees there. And, uh, you know, being reading about uh, Roald Amundsen when I was about eight, nine years old, I had this daydream, you know, being going out there in the wide open spaces. So I think, and I like, uh, I like, I really like weather and wind. So it, you know, feel, I feel alive when it's really <laughs> stormy sometimes. <laughs> so I think it's, um, you know, the upbringing, I think it's the most, uh, you know, it's the answer to your question that um, I still love the winters and, and skiing, so, uh, so I think that's the answer on, my, on your question. I think that's a good answer. Um, following the 1992 expedition, you became the first woman in the world to ski solo and then supported to the South Pole. I was yeah, that was in 94. That was in 94. Yeah, so how, how did that come about? After doing the Greenland crossing in 92, there was a Norwegian guy that uh, skied solo and unsupported to the pole. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked Julie if she wanted to join me uh, on that expedition, but she's more a climber. So she said she was tired of that open wide sp spaces. So, and then I knew uh, Arling Kage and I, I was older than him. I knew I had uh, much more experience on glaciers. Mm -hmm. And I used, and, and, and I, I knew that I was a good skier and uh, also introvert. So I, I know, knew that I could cope with myself for many days. Yeah. So, and then I came back from Greenland. I said to my husband, you know, maybe I should, you know, fulfill my dream to ski to the South Pole. And he said right away, yeah, I'm sure you can do it. Go ahead. So I got support from family and friends. And uh, so the hardest part was to, uh, to do the funding. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's always the hardest part with, uh, with uh, all my expeditions, I think. Yeah. Um, I went to a talk by Ranulf Fines where he actually said that the hardest part is trying to secure the sponsorship for the big trips. So mm -hmm. I was wondering how you're able to do that? 
Well, it's hard, you know, the, on the solo trip, uh, I did not, I felt that I moved into the men's last arena in no way, got equipment, skis and stuff. And then um, uh, Birge Ausland, um, another Norwegian explorer, mm. he was supported by, um, by Italian sponsor, the Sector Spotwatches. So I, uh, so I got in contact with them and they said, okay, if you can make it, you, uh, you, uh, we will pay you when you come back. So I took up our bank loan and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I made it. And then they paid me the, the, the money back when I came, returned. Mm -hmm. um, did you grow up in Oslo? Yeah, in the outskirts of Oslo. Okay, yeah. that's where you are now still. Yeah, it's not far away. I'm I'm actually since I got divorced, I'm moving up in the forest. I'm living in a in a place next to a little pond and uh, with my Siberian husky. Yeah, sounds good. What was it like living there as a child? And when did you realize that you didn't want to follow the typical female expectations? Well, I I remember uh, one um, thing that's. I realized that I did not have the same dreams as my friends. Uh, I was, I think I was around 12. We went on a, on a trip to Germany with my school brass band. Nice. And I think we were about six, eight girls are sitting in a room and exchanged dreams. And all my friends, they were dreaming of a handsome husband, big, ha big house and a fancy car. Yeah. And I was thinking, I was very naive. 12 year old girl and I was thinking how boring to dream about something with, that would come automatically when I grew up <laughs> I was thinking <laughs> and it was when it came to my turn I said well my dream is to ski to the South Pole and I still today I remember their reaction their laughter and said that's stupid that's impossible that's a boy's dream mm -hmm. so I think that was the first uh, uh, you know I just sensed that that I didn't have the same <laughs> dreams like my friends. And also when I grew up and started to, you know, 20, 20 study, some of my friends got married. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, you know, I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if I, you know, was really wanted kids actually. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had, I, I really love kids because I, I, I so I, I, I was a teacher and I coached, uh, you know, cross-country skiers and uh, orienteering. So I really like the kids. But so, um, so, I, so I made sort of the decision, I think, that I should not have kids. But then I met a widower with three young girls. So I got a, you know, fixed family. And of course, that's a privilege today. I have six grandchildren. So, mm -hmm. so, so that's how that ended. Yeah. How hard would you say that it has been to be a female in a male-dominated industry? I think it's. Uh, I, th I think it's. It was hard. I think it's changing now. Yeah. Well, you you know that because you're younger. I don't know how you feel it, but um, uh, now it's many women that have skied to the South Pole and. Uh, and and at my time, you know, there were pretty good uh, women climbers in in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Italy. So on some uh, arenas, I think uh, women were pretty pretty. But you know, of course, the it in in my generation, it was it was. I think it was harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you're very modest and I think you're very successful but how would you define success personally? Well I think if you uh, if you're if I myself are content with what I've been doing and what I've been you know achieved mm -hmm. I think that's the next success because nobody else can sort of tell you because you know you know deep inside that this this was good mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's the most important thing yeah that's uh, yeah okay um also i was wondering what is the worst thing that's ever happened on an expedition on um, my expeditions mm -hmm. yeah i think it was when Anne and i had an attempt to ski to the to the north pole from siberia mm -hmm. 
and there was a heavy, really heavy storm. So the, the ice was breaking up and, uh, and it was breaking up in the middle of the night. And I, you know, if it was cold and I was just got this feel, I heard something. And then I went, uh, went out to see the, in the, um, in the outside in the tent, it was, you know, I could see down to the water. Mm -hmm. So I woke up and, and then I heard this sound. And when I was looking out, because it was dusk, I could see this big wall of uh, ice coming closer and closer. Yes. So, um, so if I haven't, you know, and I took the sleds and run uh, with them and I was, you know, trying to get the tent, move the tent. And uh, when I took the last ice screw and uh, so I could uh, get the tent to move the tent, the mm -hmm. first shock of ice came over me. Yeah. So, so if I had been laying in the sleeping bag for 10 more or 15 more minutes, we had been, you know, crushed down to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. So I still got this, you know, ter you know, feeling when it's springtime and you can hear the sound of the, the ice, you know, very beautiful. But to me, it's sort of a kind of a nightmare yeah. when I hear that sound of ice. So I think that was the most scary thing. Mm -hmm. We also got attacked by a polar bear, and um, but uh, well, we it was really uh, pack ice. It's, we had we were followed by a young polar bear, mm -hmm. and when we were uh, on an open sort of open uh, new frozen area, so there was you could you know it was easy to see around. Mm -hmm. uh, I relaxed a little, so I put the revolver on and sled in front of me. And then I turned and saw the polar bear coming, uh, attacking. So I had, I, I, I've been working on the guide of Svalbard for 30 years. So I've, you know, I've seen polar bears, but I could not reach, I knew I couldn't reach my revolver. And mm -hmm. I had this signal pen. So I aimed at him and I hit him in, you know, his, on, on his breast. Mm -hmm. And he was just, I think it was just, few meters you know because he was you know on the ice he was just but he it was banged here so he he started to move right away mm -hmm. and uh, that was also a scary scary thing yeah how do you deal with fear in these situations well i could hear I've, i was swallowing my heart i felt that was <laughs> swallowing my heart it was just and um, I'm not sure if that sort of supported my or comforted myself. And Anna said, well, I think it was heading to my, my sled, not me, because, you know, it's, my sled is more looking like a seal than, than us. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, and then just an hour later, we crossed an open lead. We were swimming over, you know, with dry suits. So mm -hmm. it stopped following us. So it's, um, so that was. Yeah. That was that. <laughs> yeah. Scary. <laughs> yeah, I can see why. Um, who is a female, um, a role model that you look up to? Well, that's not an ex that's not an explorer. I remember reading, um, you know, when when I was young, it was sort of a series of biographies, mm -hmm. and I was reading about uh, Marie Curie, Madame Curie, that got the Nobel Prize in Physics and Chemistry. And uh, I remember, I think that was the same time when I was on, um, on that brass band uh, trip to Germany, because then uh, my friend said, you can't do it. And uh, people said to Marie Curie, you can't start, you know, you can start studying at Sorbonne, that's only for men. Mm -hmm. So I was just, it's, that was a kind of a comfort. She was also moving into the men's uh, last arena. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was, I, 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 I think that was my first role model. And also my mother, she's a really good skier. So, you know, she was not a sort of a typical mother in the young, early 60s. She, mm -hmm. you know, she wanted to, when the weekends come, we went cross country skiing, the whole family. So, um, and my friends, my mothers, they were going, they were staying home making Sunday dinner or something <laughs> with my mother. Well, we got dinners, but you know, we were skiing the whole day. So yeah. I think that's, that's, I think the upbringing is, I had a really luck with parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Are those all of your books behind you? Hmm? Are those your books behind you? Yes, oh, behind me? 
Yeah. 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 Some of them. Some of them. Okay, because I was reading um, a couple pieces on you, and in one of them it said that you're an insatiable reader. Yeah. So I was wondering what sort of books you read, and if you could maybe recommend any. Oh, it's hard, you know, I'm just reading all the time. But right now I'm uh, actually going back because I read all the classics when I was in my 20s, just following the, um, I'm not sure the English title, The Brother of Karamazov by Dostoevsky. Okay. So, I'm, so I actually started it on uh, uh, that book right now, and also I'm. Uh, um, it's a new translation of the um, Plague by uh, Camus mm -hmm. uh, that I'm reading, um, and um, and what is else? You know, I have I'm, I have so, sort of several, and now it's another. Just got one today in the post and. Uh, it's it's actually the word history it's it's a it's a professor that is you know he's focusing on water the importance of water through you know the the world history mm -hmm. so i'm going to start that one no i'm i i'm a i'm i'm, I'm reading mixed things actually mm -hmm. especially this um this covid you know times we uh, it's it's a lot of time to to read I, I don't watch television, for instance. That's why mm -hmm. I have a lot of time to read. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they sound good. <laughs> Could you tell me more about Bancroft, Arneson, Explore Access Water? Yeah. We, uh, when I crossed the Antarctic continent with Anne, mm -hmm. we made uh, two curriculums, one that we called Dare to Dream and one multi-subject about Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that was in the beginning of internet. So we had, I don't remember how many million kids that followed us. And we also called CNN twice a week. So we got a lot of, you know, media hits. So we just decided to, and we become really good friends. I, we, I, we call each other sister souls. Yeah. So, uh, so we, and um, after that, at, at, uh, the um, attempts to reach the North Pole, we decided, and then uh, the last time we worked with um, the international uh, international polar year, and about global warming, and that was you know that's too, it was too abstract for the young kids, and also or or the website was hacked by uh, Americans that don't believe in uh, global warming, yeah. and we <laughs> realized that we should start up with something you know something simpler. So that's what we uh, decided to access to fresh water. Mm -hmm. And also to, to have, um, we d decided to invite one woman from each continent with different age, different religion, different experience. Mm -hmm. So we as a group, as a team, we had to work together as the rest of the world had to work together to solve the um, the, uh, the that challenge the, uh, with fresh water mm -hmm. so that it was the idea so um so we did the ganges and we did the yangtze in in uh, china and we had a meeting uh doing the mississippi but then we lost a big sponsor mm -hmm. uh, so we just realized that we should now invite the um, the women and they by themselves they have to uh, figure out the funding themselves so the plan was now to paddle um oh i don't remember that so it's, it's a difficult name it's the the river in new zealand that had got human rights okay it's in the Ma maori district and uh, we have a team member from new zealand that's uh, maori mm -hmm. so uh, so that was the idea we have, the plan was to do this this january but you know right now it's no traveling <laughs> yeah. yeah so that's the plan okay uh, yeah <laughs> well i have one last question and it's regarding you know like what's next i mean i know you just said that but have you got any other big plans or like what are your plans for the next few years no you know it's it's sort of uh, to follow up the access water because we want to do one waterway on each continent Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, um, so if uh, this um, this uh, pandemia is sort of, we find a solution for that, we will continue maybe, maybe in 
22, you know, winter 22 and go to New Zealand. Yeah. And so what's next for you? So obviously I was meant to do the Walking Wheels expedition this May, but because of coronavirus, yeah. I'm thinking next May, if yeah. we've never yeah. travel. I'm just in Wales. I'm trying to write a book. I'm trying to plan and, you know. So you did, you did your Wales trip, right? Or did you not do it? No, because, no, no, because of the pandemic, yeah. Yeah, so it is. It's like a great trip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but also during this time, I found more and more interesting people. Yeah. Like even in my local area, there is a, a Satanist. He was a former Satanist and now he's a priest. Wow. Yeah, he's had a major lifestyle change. <laughs> so I want to meet with him. Um, there is a psychic, just a local psychic that works on an oncology ward. So oh. I want to talk with her as well and kind of chat about, you know, what Interesting. she's had in her yeah. life. Um, do you know, there's a caver called Martin Farr. Okay, I mean, he's big in Wales, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. He's uncovered some really cool things, like all across the world in caves. And he oh, yeah, in yeah. Norway. I think I have, I think I heard about that, yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm hoping to meet with him as well. So like, yeah. there's of really, really cool people in Wales that hopefully I can meet with and learn more about and then when I do do the big walk across Wales then I would have already met some of the coolest people yeah fantastic yeah so that's it wow yeah so, so it's yeah a trip will probably will be you know much more have much more content than you start when you started to think about it so that's fantastic yeah I mean we're still slightly concerned because we wanted to stay with people yeah so yeah we wanted to you know, spend a night or two with strangers and just kind of meet as many people as we could, but with social distancing and the masks and yeah, uh, yeah. But we're hopeful it should be good. Yeah. Well, good luck for thank planning you. and meeting new people. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. Well, it was really nice meeting you. So good luck with everything. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Bye.